Well, good afternoon. We have the pleasure to welcome today Professor Jorin Gross. Professor Gross studied chemical process engineering at the Technical University of Berlin, where he did his doctorate on the equation of states of simple, associated, and macromolecule substance. For 2000 to 2004, he worked in process development at BASF. After I stayed as associate professor at the Technical University of Delft, he took off over the chair for thermodynamics and thermal process engineering at the University of Stuttgart in 2010. He's also a member of, of the board of several journals. Professor Gross' work is based on molecular thermodynamics. He investigates macromolecules and their interactions with ionic, associate, and polar components. On this base, he was able to describe mixtures of substance and calculate the properties in advance. As part of his doctorate, together with Professor Wolfgang and Professor Sadowski, they developed the PCSEF equation of state. So welcome, Professor Gross. Thank you, and please feel free to start your presentation. Thank you, Marlon, for a very kind introduction. I'm impressed how you found out about my professional path. Um, I'll share my screen. Yep. So, um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to uh, speak in this seminar series. I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for putting this together and I'm, I'm very honored to be um, a part of this impressive lineup of speakers. Um, and it's a, it's a pleasure to speak about uh, interfacial properties and I'm um, speaking about uh, density functional theory today. Um, <clears throat> my talk is not meant to be an overview, a review talk uh, on the field um, entirely, but it's, it's really dedicated to work that we have done in my group. And when I say my group, I mean uh, talented scientists uh, shown here. Um, the work I'm presenting is really their work. It's a uh, work of Elmar Sauer, who has graduated uh, with a PhD, uh, Rolf Stiele, um, Philipp Rena, Johannes Eller, who are uh, PhD um, students, and Gernot Bauer, who's a postdoc in my group. Um, I have no picture of Benjamin Bursik, who just finished his master thesis. And um, really, it's their work I'm presenting. So um, what I'd like to speak about is uh, I have a few theory slides on classical density functional theory. I think it's not all too heavy. It's a few slides. Um, and I'm then turning to applications, and that's uh, fluid uh, liquid interfaces, meaning vapor liquid and liquid liquid interfaces. <clears throat> I'll speak about curved uh, interfaces, and I'm excited about surfactants. Um, I'll skip the predictive density gradient theory. I took that out of my presentation uh, last minute to stay in time. And I'll uh, then turn to interfaces uh, towards solid structures, adsorption in porous material, uh, solvation-free energies, and um, lastly, on uh, dynamic problems and applications of density functional theory. So I'd like to start with the functional we're working with that is based on the pc saft equation of state and on the framework of uh, classical density functional theory. So the equation of state has a structure as visualized in this slide. Um, it's uh, an equation of state that is a member of the Saft family, so to say, of statistical associating fluid theory uh, that is rooted on the beautiful work of Michael Wertheim, uh, who proposed a theory for the directional interactions that enabled the formation of chains. And um, it's based on work of, of Walter Chapman, um, George Jackson and Keith Gubbins, who really extended that framework uh, to mixtures of well-defined uh, chains. And um, so the molecular model shown here uh, is coarse-grained. We assume molecules to be composed of chains of spherical segments. Um, but the molecular model captures the essential characteristics of real molecules, the non-spherical shape and various interactions. And the various interactions can be van der Waals-like interactions, we refer to them as dispersion, uh, but can also be highly directional interactions uh, of short range, like, um, like hydrogen bonding, and we refer to that as associ association. 
um, and can also be directional um, interactions longer range and that's dipolar quadrupolar type of interactions. So um, the functional uh, we're using is based on this equation of state. I'd like to speak about classical density functional theory and I think it's uh, yeah, instructive to look at a liquid vapor interface. And a liquid uh, vapor interface macroscopically is a very sharp, it is, appears infinitely sharp jump of density from a liquid-like density to a vapor density. Microscopically, on a nanometer scale, of course, that transition is continuous. And um, so classical density functional theory uh, gives a framework of calculating this density profile and uh, along with it, um, quantities of you know, interfaces like free energies and, and what have you. The starting point is the grand potential. Um, which is the Helmholtz energy minus the Gibbs uh, energy with, written here as chemical potential times number of molecules. So um, for a mixture, this is a vector and this is a vector and this is a scalar product. I think that's clear. Now the variables are very suitable uh, and suited for um, interfacial problems. Uh, the variables of the grand potential are volume, temperature and chemical potential. The last two, temperature and chemical potential, um, in an equilibrium system are constant throughout space. So that's very convenient. And V is the extensive quantity. It's very intuitive to choose these variables. Now, if we have these three variables, volume, temperature, and chemical potential, then we have no grips on the density profile. That's an internal degree of freedom. And I write out the uh, grand potential functional here. So the grand potential functional is still a function of these three variables. I don't show them, but of course that depends on the three variables. And it's a functional, functional of density. And the Helmholtz energy is a functional of density. And this is the chemi chemical potential. Number of molecules is the density integrated over space, R being a space coordinate, a vector in space, and the integration goes over the volume. So um, what do we know from thermodynamics? We know that among all density profiles that are thinkable and possible, um, the one that is actually experimentally observed is the one that minimizes the grand potential functional. So uh, in, in minimum, this grand potential functional is equal to the grand potential itself, right? The equilibrium condition is thus, or implies that the functional derivative of omega with respect to density is zero. So this is minimizing or a condition for minimizing this quantity. On the right hand side, then we have uh, the functional derivative of Helmholtz energy and the functional derivative of this second term here simply gives the chemical potential. So that's the equation we really work with. That's the equation uh, we have to solve. And we do that by discretizing space uh, in this picture, we would discretize space um, along the x-coordinate for a one-dimensional problem, for example, and solve this equation for every point in space. Uh, what is needed to calculate um, interfacial property, heterogeneous uh, or um, yeah, heterogeneous systems is a functional of the Helmholtz energy. And what is needed is the Helmholtz energy and the equation of state I've just shown is written in terms of this Helmholtz energy. And I'll guide you through, let's say the first four terms of this equation and I'll skip the idle gas because that's known analytically, that's, it, that's simple. So I'll start off with the transition from an ideal gas of, uh, of space coordinates to um, half spheres. So the hard sphere uh, contribution um, is shown here, beta being one divided by temperature, one divided by Boltzmann uh, constant and temperature, F being the Helmholtz energy contribution to the hard spheres, um, rho is the density, K is a generic index uh, saying for all components in the system. So for eight components in the system, K runs from one to eight. R being the space coordinate, 
And uh, in equilibrium, we can also write this um, Helmholtz energy as a Helmholtz energy density integrated over space. So there's nothing wrong with doing that. It's general for, for equilibrium conditions, even local equilibrium. So now that Helmholtz energy density or Helmholtz energy density is still a functional of uh, density. And I'd like, maybe not all scientists are deeply rooted in functional math. So I'd like to be sure I explain what it is. Um, we all know what a function is. It, uh, a simple function um, projects a scalar value onto another scalar value. That's clear. A functional projects a function, so for example, the full density profile here, onto a scalar value. So um, here we have a functional and I indicate them by square brackets. Uh, so what enters uh, for calculating this quantity is not only at a position r, is not only the value of density at that position r, but the full profile. And usually, well, what enters is, enters more importantly in the vicinity of where we are at r, so with a certain weight. And I'll thereby introduce the word weight. I'll come back to the word weight in a minute. Jakob uh, Rosenfeld has proposed a marvelous um, expression for the Helmholtz uh, energy of hard spheres. And he says, uh, by very good approximation, the functional can be written as a function of a number of weighted densities. They are themselves functionals of density, but this F is only a function of N. Now, a number of them, L indicates a generic index from one to five, several of them. Um, and the structure of this weighted density is, is given here. So this is really a weight in a certain range um, around a point R uh, and the density integrated over that point, around that point R, so to say. And I'll come back to that equation in a minute. Um, so let's hold on to that equation and I'll return to it in a minute because that's the core of what has to be calculated. I'll show a second expression going from um, hot spheres to chains requires a term and that's based on Wertheim's theory um, and extensions of, uh, of Walter Chapman, George Jackson, Keith Governs, and um, a DFT formalism has, has been devised by uh, Walter Chapman and his group, wonderful work by Tripathi and Chapman and early by Jane and Chapman. So that is what we use and uh, that requires again weighted densities like this one here and this one here, but otherwise this is all very accessible. And the dispersive contributions can also be written with or in terms of a weighted, a weighted density. So what we propose is that the Helmholtz energy density uh, as a functional of densities is perceived as being a function of a appropriately weighted, so to say, averaged density. And that uh, average density is written here and it has the same structure as the ends I have just shown. So it's a very simple um, object. I'll show the n again and it has the same structure as this and I'll say what it actually does. It doesn't look very appealing, but it's a simple equation. So let's go through it. This is uh, a quantity required at a position r. So this is a vector pointing to r. Um, and we have to integrate a space or the entire space, r prime. Um, and the density at this position or at any you know, um, location r prime. Um, but here the weight function is somehow uh, of rather short range. So it says uh, outside of a distance r around space code, not r, so capital R, um, around uh, vector r, uh, the heavy side function is zero. So that's irrelevant. So we only have to, and within the sphere r, uh, the heavy side function is unity. So we simply have to collect in a way densities within a sphere in space. So that's it. Um, and all math in density functional theory really boils down to solving this kind of equation. Um, it's not very difficult. Uh, if we fully transform this, um, then it's a simple product. This is a convolution equation. It's a simple product of density 
and a wave function. And that's how we actually solve it. I'll not speak much more about uh, the numer numerics, um, and rather I'd like to go into applications. So once that Helmholtz energy functional is defined, we can go ahead and calculate interfacial properties like the interfacial tension uh, for pure substances, and um, that varies with temperature and is zero at the critical point. You see various compounds here and here, and uh, the lines are predictions and the symbols are experimental data, and we find very good agreement. I mean, uh, I speak of prediction because the theory has no available parameters. Uh, the pure component parameters were determined many years earlier with the initial publication of PC soft and, and they were used unaltered. So this is a prediction. No interfacial property has entered this calculation in that sense. We find very good agreement. Um, these are old results, uh, about five years old. Um, a calculation uh, for you know, starting from scratch, uh, calculating a phase equilibrium and solving, you know, the density functional theory equations, iterating that to, to convergence uh, takes 30, about 30 milliseconds. So it's rather swift for a single point, including the phase equilibrium calculation. So we then uh, looked at mixtures. This is a mixture of tetrahydrofurane and hexane, and uh, this is an azeotropic mixture in a, you know, pressure versus composition projection. And on the right hand side, we see the surface tension uh, versus composition, and and one observes very good agreement. I mean, surprising. Um, the line is the calculation prediction. No interfacial quantity entered to the calculation, and the symbols are experimental data that consider the I mean, the scale, very good, good agreement. And this is not an isolated result. It gets, it, you know, we find good agreement for many mixtures. It gets tricky with what? With water, of course. Um, and it starts to be tricky with alcohols. There, the results are not always good. You know, you, all of a sudden you have degeneracy of parameters and blah, everything that we all fight with. And we never looked at electrolyte systems starting to do so, but I have not obtained results so far. Um, so these old results I included to build some faith in the density functional theory and that it is actually rather strong in predicting quantities. Uh, these are results for carbon dioxide and, and decaying. And this is a composition of carbon dioxide in the liquid phase. And as pressure increases, the carbon dioxide dissolves more and more in the liquid phase until, you know, at this point we find uh, a critical point and the surface tension vanishes, like the distinction between the two phases vanishes. At some intermediate pressure, we can calculate uh, the density profiles and, and, you know, we see that carbon dioxide substantially accumulates at the interface and this is confirmed by molecular simulations. This is really not an, an artifact and the line is a prediction and the symbols are experimental data. So then, wow, we thought maybe we could even do liquid-liquid uh, systems and uh, I was hesitant at first and not expecting all too much, but really it works rather nice. Um, water is tricky as always, uh, but glycol systems, hydrocarbon systems, for example, we have a very good agreement between experimental data and calculated data. Uh, considering that liquid-liquid interfacial tensions are low and are rather subtle uh, to predict. So with aqueous systems, we start to see deviations already in the phase diagram. So this is, I guess, the hydrocarbon phase and the amount of glycol dissolved in that phase. And this is the glycol phase and the, essentially the amount of the other compound dissolved. <laughs> So for water, we start to see deviations in these diagrams. And then, of course, the, the surface tension is also not in great agreement with experimental aid. Let's look at curved interfaces. And this is work of Philippe Riener. Um, what li I'd like to advertise here is uh, to consider um, a second order expansion as proposed by Helfrich. Uh, the interfacial tension gamma is written as an expansion around a value for a planar interface in terms of curvature parameters. Um, a curved 
interface, arbitrarily curved interface has principal radii R1 and R2. And rather than expanding in R1, R2, if we propose to expand in terms of J and K, like shown in this slide. And for spherical you know, interfaces, radius one and radius two are the same and they're referred to as R, the radius. So then these uh, coefficients, the first of them being um, first order contribution being, where is it here? Uh, the uh, Tolman length, they can all be calculated with density functional theory. Um, and what is this sufficient to do that is a calculation on planar interfaces. And I said, well, this takes 30 milliseconds. Um, so with that, you can calculate uh, the interfacial tension versus, you know, for any radius uh, you're interested in, uh, according to a second order expansion. The line is this expansion. So blue is for um, a spherical geometry, red, let's ignore red, it's for cylindrical geometries. Um, so I'll guide you through this. Zero in inverse radius means a planar interface. And towards the right, towards the right, we increase the curvature and uh, go to smaller and smaller droplets. Towards, you know, I go back to a planar interface. Towards the left, I sort of have the, the liquid phase on the, yeah, on this side, if you can see my picture, and the wave on this side. So we look at bubbles, and bubbles that are increase, increasingly small towards the left. So um, the symbols are uh, full calculations, full DFT calculations in spherical coordinates, and you know, it's cool. quite involved for large droplets. Um, uh, for, yeah, both for large droplets and for small droplets, that's tricky. Um, but really the second order expansion works beautifully. Um, and uh, that expansion is obtained from a single calculation uh, planar interface. And you can see uh, that, for example, nucleation of a, of a droplet and of a bubble are different. Uh, a nucleation of a bubble progresses along the path from right to center. The nucleation of a bubble progresses from left to center and the barrier that is observed is really different. So let's look at water surfactant systems. Um, what is interesting are the phenomenon uh, like the uh, enrichment of these surfactants at a liquid liquid or liquid vapor interface uh, and structures like bilayers and micelles. And what I consider in, in this you know on the forthcoming slides is um, a class of uh, surfactants uh, shown here, it's polyethylene glycol alkyl ether. So it's an alkyl tail that I sort of schematically show with reddish color and a polar head. And it can also be two polar heads or three and so forth. So the nomenclature is shown here, head, two, tail, what is it, seven, for example. So this is the nomenclature I'm using. Um, the tail is parametrized from a group contribution, piece soft equation of state. The, the head is, uh, we simply assigned water uh, parameters to start with. And what is needed is a segment-based approach. And I uh, advertised the work of, uh, of Jane, uh, Dominic, and Walter Chapman uh, earlier, and that is what we use. We use um, a segment-based chain functional, uh, ISAFT, and that, um, you know, connects sequentially spheres onto one another, and that is reflected uh, in terms of equations by sort of a hierarchy, a, re a recursion type of uh, equation where, um, you know, this structure is seen. So we have one segment alpha and the connection to the previous uh, segment alpha is uh, captured by these, by these integrals, okay? Let me skip this slide and only point towards water that can be parameterized such that it gives actual you know, reasonable agreement with individual tensions. And then let's look at, at results. So this is um, an, a vapor liquid system. On the left-hand side, uh, vapor phase, right-hand side, liquid phase. And we see indeed, you know, enrichment of strong, pronounced enrichment of this uh, surfactant at the interface. 
and it does perform the way we had expected it to perform. The polar head is pointed towards the liquid and the alkyl tail is pointed away. So let's scale in the next picture, I scale this down by a factor 10. So that moves this up by a factor 10, you could say. And, oh yes, and then I collect all of the reddish colored uh, alkyl chains to one peak, so to say. So this is the comparable picture. And that compares very well with, you know, what we find in literature, experimental data um, on uh, such as surfactant, uh, that's neutron reflection measurements. Um, and, you know, it's, we can only conclude that it has qualitative agreement because really we didn't parameterize our uh, surfactant very well. We said the head group is simply water. And we have to do a second loop of, of improving uh, on that parameterization. Um, but the agreement is, is marvelous. And huh? we have really the accumulation uh, reflected in these calculations without further ado. This is simply a result. So then, uh, you know, you can play around with it and ask yourself, how does uh, a second head group affect uh, the surface tension? And the surface tension is lowered from a pure vapor, oh, this is liquid, liquid, uh, from a, a pure water to alkane system having 44. Um, millinewton per, per meter uh, to 20. And if you add a second head group, that's lowered even more. So then we can start to, you know, study effects of how do we best lower surface tension if that is our objective. There are um, complex bilayers or more complex structures that can be calculated. On the left-hand side, a single bilayer. On the right-hand side, a, a double bilayer. And, um, now, um, what we see is, you know, really the double, um, the, the, the bilayered structure with the polar groups to the side uh, shown here and the alkyl chains pointed inside. Now we also see these are metastable structures. Um, the interfacial tension is 70 uh, for that single bilayer. It's 20 for the double bilayer. So more stable is the, is the left. But both are metastable. So they would dissolve. Um, uh, this is a, so to say, local uh, minimum. So one has to be re really careful in working with these surfactants. That's also seen in my cells. Uh, we look at, uh, you know, circular structures here in radial coordinates. And um, there are two my cells that both can be calculated and both are local minima. So you, the solutions to the equations we're, we're giving. Uh, but with different radius. So one has to be very diligent in calculating the right thing. And you, has, you have to judge what is stable by looking at you know, the free energy of these structures. But I was excited to see, and that's work of Philipp Rehner and uh, Benjamin Borsig, that these structures can be calculated so beautifully. Let me now turn to solid fluid interfaces. And um, now, uh, Solid, what's a solid from the perspective of a, of a fluid? Mm, I have a solid here and my thumb, let's say my thumb is a fluid. From the perspective of my thumb, a solid is something that is harshly repulsive at some point. So, um, whoops. So really from the perspective of a fluid, uh, a solid is an external potential that is somehow repulsive, steeply repulsive at some point. A wall is also usually attractive. Um, you know, a real ball is attractive. Uh, my thumb is not sensitive enough to realize it's attractive, but geckos can climb, you know, glass walls and stuff because of the attraction, because of this, of this part of the uh, potential. So yeah, we can, we can then, you know, calculate the fluids at such a wall and determine you know, what is shown here is a sort of a wetting layer um, how does the wall enter? It enters um, onto the effective chemical potential, which is bracketed here. So this is the chemical potential from, let's say, intermolecular interactions only, and uh, minus the external potential, that's the effective chemical potential acting on a species uh, I. 
So then the, the same equation has to be solved except that uh, this external potential enters. And uh, this can be done, for example, for calculating absorption isotherms. Um, what is you know, wanted is a diagram uh, like done in usually undergraduate labs, uh, absorbed amount versus either concentration of the solution or pressure, if you will. And what is defined is the pore geometry and, and the interaction energies and so forth. So uh, what is the pressure in a porous medium? Well, what is usually meant is the pressure of a reservoir that is connected to the porous medium having the same chemical potential. So that is what we actually have. This is what is shown in this type of diagram. And uh, that requires you know, connecting the pressure with the chemical potential and then with the amount absorbed. And we do that both in um, DFT and in molecular simulations. We use Monte Carlo techniques here. Uh, in fact, we use um, um, a transition matrix Monte Carlo to sort of in one calculation sample all the densities uh, from a vapor to a dense state. And that works beautifully. Um, transition matrix was proposed by Fitzgerald, uh, Picard, Silva, and was um, uh, applied to our systems and, and really um, shown to to work very powerfully by uh, Jeffrey uh, Errington. So these are results. Uh, this is two species, both spherical in cylindrical pools. Let me skip this slide and immediately, immediately go to, um, to butane, for example, in a pool. And this is an equilibrium between sort of a not so full pore with a full pore. This is an adsorption isotherm density versus pressure. And, and here I show the two states, uh, more liquid-like and more not so full, more vapor-like, if you will. Uh, these calculations take, starting from nothing, from really um, a constant level, 100 milliseconds, so per, per state. It's very cheap. This is an absorption isotherm for a mixture, and then we compare that to an IAST uh, um, type of approach. And although IAST is parameterized for, for the pure components, right, the molecular simulation data enters of both pure species methane and butane uh, at high densities, DFT is much better. Although DFT is predictive for anything, both pure substances and, and for mixtures. There's no adjustable parameter. We simply use what we've done in molecular simulations as well. Um, so these are results and I think I have to speed up a little bit. Well, yes. So um, in the next, um, in this slide, I look at uh, absorption in more realistic environments. And more realistic environments are heterogeneous. And that is either by roughness or by chemical heterogeneity. So we looked at an approach proposed by the Imperial Group, um, Forte um, um, and, uh, and co-workers. And that averages from a low density, um, the interactions, it essentially gives you an potential of mean poles at low density, uh, which is a function of density, but it's, you know, they propose or we, you know, they propose using it for any density, we use it for any density and it works beautifully. Um, we go back, this is the potential in this coordinate, in this coordinate, this is the potential in that direction, I'll turn it around. Um, so it is harshly repulsive, it's attractive and in the middle, well, almost approaches zero. So this is the effective potential. Uh, red is fivefold the energy parameter as compared to gray. And indeed, we get you know, a wonderful agreement between the full two-dimensional picture in symbols compared to the simple one-dimensional uh, calculation in lines. So really, we get away with averaging things from a low density and can still get good results, at least for small uh, molecules. And we also did that for rough, you know, molecularly rough surfaces and obtained similar results for small molecules. So these are uh, calculations for um, solvents, uh, in this case, methane in um, coughs, covalent organic frameworks. And we find wonderful agreement between 
you know, DFT calculations and uh, molecular simulations. Now this is three dim dimensional calculations and really we were happy with a good agreement because that allows us then to, for example, optimize force fields or at least help in optimizing force fields for molecular simulations. This is a factor. Um, we can study things like, are these COPs actually perfectly stacked? We have experimental indications, strong indication they're not, they're not perfectly stacked. Um, and we can look at mixtures and predict them. And uh, so this is really sort of encouraging. Contact angles I'll, I'll skip. I, th I think I have to round off uh, in a few minutes. So I'll skip contact angles. What we show here is, is uh, contact angles for real substances and calculated with DFT, we find good agreement. Um, a very recent development is that uh, we look at um, molecules and dissolve them, so to say, in a, in a solvent. That's the solvation-free energy we're, we're targeting, and this can be done with molecular simulation. And it is on the next slide done with molecular simulation. Uh, this is usually done by, or we do it by uh, integrating this molecule into the system, so turning the interactions up, if you will, in DFT. From the perspective of the surrounding fluid, the solute is simply an external field. So we take the false field of a molecular simulation as an external field to the density functional theory. Um, that is shown in this graph. So we have various substrates, molecules, um, modeled by a false field, GAF uh, false field. And they are uh, immersed in a solvent. And this solvent is um, hexane, GAF hexane on the or, uh, ordinate and PC soft hexane on the abscesses. And we find very good or rather good agreement. I mean, um, considering, I mean, this is, uh, this is the density feel of PC soft hexane around, I think it's benzene and I think it's hexane down here. Not sure. Um, but we really find rather good agreement. Uh, and this is now interesting because of course, this is, uh, can be applied to large molecules like biomolecules or what have you. The disadvantage at this point being, of course, um, in, PC, in the PC soft density functional theory, um, these force fields are considered rigid. So that's a, you know, a drawback of the approach. This is quite um, uh, fascinating that we can calculate large or more complex structures. This is all atom force field and we simply use that and got good agreement. The last bit is um, an outlook, uh, essentially. Um, the density functional theory can also be used uh, to um, um, yeah, model uh, fluid mechanic problems, if you will, like uh, coalescence behavior or uh, flow in micro or porous media. Uh, so the balance equations are given here. This is a mass balance and a component balance. And um, in the component balance, the density functional theory enters, and that is because it's a driving force for diffusion. So this is a diffusion equation. It's a bit simplified um, from the Maxwell-Stefan equation, just to show the general structure of things. Uh, the diffusional flux of a component, you know, is dependent on the driving force of that component, actually on all other species as well. Um, and uh, the chemical potential is the driving force. The chemical potential is shown here. It's the same equations that are used in, D in DFT. So that's good. And the uh, momentum balance is shown here. So this is a change of momentum with time. This is due to you know, flow um, and forces. So the forces you know, include now with this expression forces from interfaces. Uh, very naturally, in a homogeneous system, this whole term simplifies to being uh, a gradient in pressure. So this can then, for homogeneous systems, or uh, simplifies to the um, simple uh, Navier-Stokes equation. The last term is, uh, this is the pressure, shear pressure tensor. Uh, so with positive sign, this is the 
this is a tensor used by people from you know fluid mechanics. And we have first results. Um, these results are uh, shown in this slide. We have a, a droplet large and a droplet small in a vapor. It's a pure substance uh, in this case, really first results. And um, we don't have to parameterize anything. Uh, the system of equations knows that the small droplet is not stable and the large droplet is stable and it will dissolve. And this is what it does. It dissolves without further parameterizing it to dissolve or parameterizing interfacial tension or anything of, of that nature. So this is the result. And we, as a second example, looked at uh, the coalescence of droplets. And here we go. This is a coalescence event. And now, if we think of what I've shown before, for example, you know, mixtures and surface surfactants and so this is a very powerful approach uh, for the future I think. So with that I'd like to conclude and my main conclusion is uh, interfaces are exciting and uh, enjoyable. I'd like to convey uh, with my talk that uh, DFT is rather strong in predicting uh, interfacial properties and also for absorptive uh, problems interfaces towards solids. Um, and with that, I'd like to acknowledge funding, but really I need to say all the work has been done by these gentlemen, all gentlemen. Um, Emma Sauer, Rolf Stierle, uh, Philipp Rehner, Johannes Eller, Gernot Bauer, uh, and ben Benjamin Gursig, who just, as I said, finished his master thesis. I don't have a picture of him. So I really, uh, yeah, I'm grateful to work with these uh, young gentlemen. And there are many female members of my group too, but not involved in DFT. So thank you very much. I didn't invite, explicitly invite questions within my talk, but of course, uh, you know, I invite uh, questions now and looking forward to vivid discussion. Thank you, Professor Gross, for the marvelous presentation. Between here and our YouTube channel, we got almost uh, 80 simultaneous viewers. And you're now up for questions. If you want to ask one, please enable the microphone or write down the chat and you read it. And our YouTube viewers can uh, write down also, of course. So any questions? Yes, uh, if I may go first. Uh, you are, thank you for beautiful presentation. Uh, I do have two questions. In the last part of the work you presented with uh, hydrodynamic dynamic DFT, uh, so when you show the, the, the balance equation for momentum, so you have the external potential acting on the pressure, uh, but you assume that the tensor, the, the, the stress tensor, doesn't change with this external potential. So basically you're assuming that the external potential you're imposing doesn't change the viscosity of the fluid, correct? Is that correct? But yes, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, let me go back to the slide and show, and show the equation that you're pointing at. Um, so, I mean, this shear pressure tensor is written usually as viscosity times uh, gradient of velocity. Now, your question is, you know, what on earth is the viscosity? Of course, for bulk phases, we know what it is. It's a scalar valued quantity, the nature of it is, however, a higher, of higher tensorial rank. Um, so really your question is very tricky and I have no clue of how to answer other than knowing, you know, at an interface, uh, the viscosity is a, is a high tensorial object. And of course you have directional, um, you know, entries. Uh, I mean, what we use is um, in practice is and, and also yeah is uh, entropy scaling. Entropy scaling links um, the residual entropy of the considered mixture to a viscosity, and it does so beautifully for bulk phases. For bulk phases, now um, there are many interesting questions related to your to your uh, question. What does entropy tell us about? you know, uh, interfacial problems, confined problems. Um, and the answer is, I don't yet know. 
but I find this fascinating. And we've started to look at the problem um, in, uh, in polls. And the easiest thing to look at is not, in my view, not viscosity, but is, is self-diffusion coefficients. And this is what we started with. Uh, but yeah, we're not very far. We just started this. But your, your question is, points exactly at this issue. Uh, thank you. And the second question is, is much easier. So when you, you show the, the comparison between the absorption isotherms for Monte Carlo simulations and DFT, they agree very well. And then you show the density uh, profile only for DFT. My question is, can you get the same density profile with the Monte Carlo simulations? Because I imagine that it, you might have higher peaks close to the surface with Monte Carlo simulations. When you use PCSAT, uh, can you achieve such high densities close to the interface? Um, uh, can you point me to the slide? Uh... Yes, I think it's, uh, I don't remember the, the number, but you have a density profile uh, within a pore. It's maybe the, the previous one, I don't know. Was it here? Yes, exactly. So this density profile is for DFT, correct? That's a DFT density profile, yes. Have you compared those with the, um, the Monte Carlo simulations? Because you, you have shown in, on the left, Yes, uh, I think the only picture I have uh, is the one on this slide. Am I still shared with my slides? I think I'm, I'm still sharing my slides, am I? Yes, yes. yes, yes. Okay. So in this, this graph was only for illustration. It's not, I didn't discuss it, uh, but the symbols are, exp are results from molecular simulations and the lines are predictions from DFT. This is sort of a wetting layer uh, on, a, on, a, on a solid. The solid is really a smooth solid. So it's a one dimensional solid. We didn't resolve the at atom positions uh, in this calculation. Um, and the density is very sharp uh, in the first layer. So this is a first adsorbed layer. The density is, uh, is in fact so sharp that uh, the value is higher than closest packing. This is only possible, of course, in a two dimensional problem. Yeah? In a three dimensional problem, this would never be possible. Um, but uh, this means, for example, that density gradient theories can never capture such, an, such a you know, profile. We find mm -hmm. a very good agreement. And it's, it is due to the fundamental measure theory that is so strong for the hard sphere model is so strong that determines essentially the, the structure here. Yes. Thank you, Professor Gerard. We have two more questions from Professor Professor Jorge, Professor Haja, and Professor Alex. Let's go in broader order, right? You can go, Professor. Jorge's, yes. Uh, Joachim, fantastic talk. I mean, you really took us in so many different topics. Um, I don't know where to start. I would like to start with the contact angles that you showed very, very little. Yes. Uh, I'm very curious. How do you... Um, calculate the contact angle from DFT. Are you getting the interfacial tensions and then you use the Young equation or you do it in, a, in another way? No, we, did, we, we tested that. Uh, and this is the simplest way we, to do it. I mean, with the, the calculations I showed were three dimensional or two dimensional calculations in cylindrical coordinates. I think that's what they were. Um, but really we get uh, the same answer uh, like in the Young equation, like you say. Uh, so we tested that and find find them to be identical. What type of, because you showed very, very briefly the contact angle plot, so I really didn't see it. What type of contact angle, uh, uh, can I see it maybe again? Yes. Uh, what type of systems are you, have you checked with the contact angle? No, um, we looked uh, mainly at smooth, not mainly, we only looked at smooth uh, interfaces. Smooth interfaces. At smooth interfaces. Uh, and what type of liquids and what type of liquids? Yeah, um, I mean, this is uh, ethane, uh, a comparison of molecular simulation to DFT and uh, the simulations are, these are very long simulations. Okay. We did them very <laughs> diligent and in fact, um, they are needed uh, long. Um, and the, the picture doesn't do justice because you see this wobbly, this mm -hmm. fluctuation, so to say, but this is only a visualization. So these are very long calculations. Okay. And we find good agreement between the, the two. Um, 
And uh, we did look at uh, experimental data here. And um, what we, uh, this is in a coll collaboration with colleagues from, from Stuttgart. They mm -hmm. did uh, look at PTFE, which is nonpolar. Okay. Um, and that is a nice test system because it really isolates the van der Waals type of interaction versus all the others. Yes. So in parameter, parameter studies, it's good to have uh, polar to non-polar mixtures. Really, that identifies problems. And uh, we did so because we wanted to test our uh, models. We'll find very good agreement. We had to parameterize the solid. Um, yes. I was about to say the solid system, has to be parameterized. Eh? The solid has to be parameterized, the, of course. The solid has to be parameterized. And we did okay. so for one component. This was octane. And the solid is characterized by one epsilon parameter, and it's the epsilon of the solid to the solid. And we you know, use Bertelot-Lorentz uh, rules from then on um, to predict other things. Yeah. I have, I have another very fast question because other people are waiting. So uh, is, have you, ha, uh, water is a problem. I mean, we have also seen that. So back to the first part of your presentation. Have you thought of putting um, um, interfacial tension data for water um, into the parameter estimation of PC shaft parameter? Will that improve uh, uh, all the properties or will it, uh, will it give some issues? Uh, yes, we did so. Uh, and we also did it for, um, for alcohols. That was work of Philipp Rehner. I mean, um, no, well, your question is difficult to answer. Your question was open. Does that give problems? Well, at least it defines the parameters more, let's say, uniquely uh, okay. with less degeneracy uh, then does only vapor uh, liquid, inter, you know, vapor liquid densities and, and vapor pressure. But so does, does it help in the liquid liquid interfacial tension for water oh yes, a lot, for example? A lot, but you do sacrifice a bit on the, uh, on the vapor, uh, vapor pressure. Vapor pressure, okay. So we do have deviations all of a sudden of, of, for alcohols of 2% uh, okay. on average and for water, I think even more. Okay. I don't remember three, four percent. So substantially. Okay, I think. Okay, thank, thank you, Joachim. Thank you very much. Yes. Is it is it my turn? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, there thank you for your presentation, Joachim. Enjoyed it very much. Uh, I'd like to go back to the uh, maybe the the theory description of the uh, interfaces and oh, of the um, surfactants. And uh, I'm particularly interested in the resolution of the head from the tail density distributions. So I'm, I'm familiar with uh, Bymaster's uh, e extension of, you know, what uh, Walter's ISAF was. And, and my understanding was that was really the point of what Bymaster did was to be able to uh, describe the, the two densities of like a head and a tail. But you seem, seem to have done that without using his approach. Could you go back to the theory part where you're describing how you do that? Yeah. Well, um, essentially, we, we, this is sort of a group contribution type of approach. We, um, define individual segments and they are individual in terms of the van der Waals parameters also in terms of um, hydrogen bonding uh, so association parameters and um, so these individual entities are then connected uh, and this is really work of, of Jane maybe Walter you can comment uh, this is the, the formalism we use uh, Walter just mentioned that he had to go. He signed off. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. I, I yeah, thought, I'm, I'm still, still here yeah. for just a second. But um, oh. yeah, so what Palab Jain did was the uh, chain free energy functionals. And uh, what um, Adam Bymaster did was to allow us to do associating polymers within the density functional theory. And there's a lot of overlap between the two words. Yeah. So, Excellent presentation, Joachim. Sorry to break in. I, oh, I do have to. So. Thanks, Walter. Take care. Yeah. 
Okay, so so if I understood what Walter said, um, it was that uh, the buy master was in, to include association on the chain. So like, but your your head groups do have the hydroxyl on the end of the ethylene oxides, right? So those are associating. Uh, so I'm still a little bit confused. Well, um, I mean, the, the uh, there are several functionals for the association, and they can be rather involved, like in the work of Bymaster. Uh, we did use a more simple approach, and that's uh, using only a, densi a weighted density. Um, that was proposed by Yang Tsung Wu, and, and that works beautifully so far. Uh, we did investigate both of them um, in an earlier study um, by uh, Mayahova and Wo and yeah, myself. And the two compared very, very well. So we decided for the simpler um, weighted, weighted density approach. Okay, so then let me see if I understood. So uh, the weighted density then is applied to the, in, in a group contribution way, to the head group and the tail group, more or less independently. Well, you have individual density profiles of a head group and a weighted density then enters for that particular head group. Right, but then these have to be attached somehow to how do you, how do you make sure that your head isn't floating further away from the tail than the, the covalent bonds will permit? There, there's, no, uh, there's no additional formalism to do so. It's, it's by labeling, uh, by giving them an index and, and sort of say attaching them to one another. Um, in that recursive procedure, they are connected to one another sequentially. And that gives the chain structure. There's no additional need um, other than the, you could say, index or sequence in this uh, recursive formula. I see. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, Professor Haja? Uh, thank you, Professor, for showing how powerful the density functional theory is, especially you even apply it to bilayers, uh, so something like lipid bilayers or something like that. There, I have some clarifications I want. One is can you define something like a inhomogeneous surface volume in these bilayers? Uh, can you clarify the question? An inhomogeneous. Okay. Uh, I was so happy to see you applying it to bilayers. Right. Yes. Say, we think for something concrete, say lipid bilayer. Like right. membrane. Can you think of something like a bilayer volume, volume parameter? For example, if you want to describe swelling, say. Will there be any oh, swelling? Now I see. Yes, swelling? now I see what you. What you're pointing at, um, I mean, what we obtain is a density distribution, uh, a density distribution, and from then on, the width of this, in a way, whoops, the width, the width of this somehow defines the volume. And now, how do, do, do you wish to define the width? Um, the, the arbitrarily you have to define them. The, the natural choice, the one that belongs in a way naturally to the surface tension is the, uh, is the um, division according to the surface of tension. Now that corresponds naturally to this surface tension and that is you know, uniquely defined, indeed. Uh, you can then determine a volume, I guess. I think this is also a question to a member of my, my group. Uh, Philip, maybe you could join me uh, for a second, but this is, I think, uh, possible. And you can see, in fact, that the volume in, let's say, the left picture and the right picture are exactly, you know, that's what is different about the two structures. Um, is that the bilayer is wider, and how do we get one and the other by the starting density profile? So this is a subtle calculation. These one has to be really diligent in define or in finding what is the most stable or the actual stable solution. Um, if you look at surface tension, one is um, 
having 20, one is having 17. So more stable is 17, and both are not entirely stable. are not stable. They are both metastable, both solutions. But, yeah, Philip, did I answer correctly? Oh, he nods. If he nods, he, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> Did I answer your question? Uh, Haja, did, did he answer your question? I think so, yeah? Uh, repeat the question? Did, no. did I answer your question? Oh, it's not very clear to me because it's related to the previous question about um, heads and tails of the <coughs> surfactant. You know, he put this like, say, group contribution methods as if the heads and tails are independent, right? Right. So, in that case, the volume is even more complicated to define, it looks like. Well, I mean, uh, not really. There are two components um, and uh, a transition in density from one to the other. Um, and the surface of tension is a unique definition of, of a location in such a transition. Um, okay. Thank you very much. So there's only one more thing. Like in adsorption, there's a void formation. No, the theory says, uh, you do you believe there can be some voids forming in the interfaces? Like for example, when it swells, when the membrane swells or the bilayer swells, will there be any void formation or no? Like, like droplets of some sort, or, or voids in terms of bubbles, or. Mm. What are voids in, in that case, case? Possible. Yeah, I, I wouldn't know the answer. <laughs> I wouldn't know the answer because I, yeah, no. I'm not sure about the phenomenon. Thank you very much. I'm satisfied. Thank you, Professor, again. So uh, let's, uh, anyone has more questions? So it's not like uh, let, let I ask you, uh, for this uh, interface phenomena, uh, did you include ions, uh, electrostatic interactions? Uh, oh, Fred, you're, you're asking a lot. No, we didn't. <laughs> no, we didn't. No, I, I try to uh, stay away from ions at, at heterogeneous systems or interfaces yeah. for a while. Now, because like, the oh, result is interested. Very I'm lovely, but uh, I wonder uh, some of these uh, interfacial uh, phenomena is very dominated by electrostatic interactions. Oh, so, yes, yeah. and fascinating. So, for example, coalescence is relies heavily on on uh, Coulomb interactions and and you know the layering of uh, of ions. Now, mm -hmm. I haven't started. Well, I, I haven't. Uh, I have started, or Johannes Eller has started to implement the functional, uh, but this was this is just very recent. We were pushed by my colleagues who were fascinated uh, from the DFT results. Um, the mm -hmm. same people that pushed us towards the hydrodynamic DFT, now they want more. They want ions. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I'm I'm fascinated by ions. We'll take a look, but uh, I have no results, no experience. Well, we are doing some uh, preliminary results uh, on dynamic DFT. So I, I, I like that you show some, some very nice results in, in, in this point. Uh, 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 my question is, uh, uh, we have a lot of data uh, relate on the uh, uh, dynamic information for interface tension. Uh, uh, can uh, maybe we use this to uh, parameterize uh, the interface properties, use this dynamic uh, at, uh, interface tension data? Do you think that's reasonable? Well, I'm not sure about dynamic interfacial tension. I, I would be interested in um, whether DFT can say anything about uh, you know, the contact line. And um, of course, really, if you look at it, it requires a definition of viscosity at every point in space. 
even at an interface. So then, I mean, I'm a bit hesitant um, because it, it requires us to make some, uh, pro, you know, parameterization or at least say something about viscosity at, uh, at a very small scale of, uh, at an interface. I think if we yes. sim simply assume for the entire liquid to be, it to be constant, probably we get quite far. But I have uh, I have to look at it, or or you have to look at it. <laughs> okay. Uh, and how about uh, the uh, interface rheology? Uh, have you think about uh, interface rheology uh, that you use DFT for maybe have some uh, relate uh, data? Uh, because people are, a lot of people are measuring uh, interface rheology, and, and, and it turns out that as some uh, phenomena in petroleum company uh, maybe are related with uh, interface rheology, uh, but I haven't seen anything in literature about this uh, using neither DFT no uh, other approach. So I wonder. For example, I, I, I'm looking for a molecular simulation, dynamic molecular simulation, uh, that gives you some information about uh, the dynamic rheology, but uh, I haven't seen this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and neither DFT, maybe uh, we can use some DFT for, for correlate or predict some this behavior. What yeah. do you think? Of well, I think along the same lines, I think, um, um, Molecular simulation need to serve as a as a reference uh, for. I mean, what really is is unknown is the microscopic transport properties, diffusion across an interface, um, uh, thermal conductivity, and and viscosity across an interface. So really, I think molecular simulations need to be the reference for that uh, type of equation. Entropy scaling can be used, and entropy scaling will give an answer. It's scalar valued, whereas the quantity that I just spoke about, as I said earlier, are tensorial in nature. At least you can calculate something. I would always tr try to do simulations first and compare results and then extrapolate or, or predict. Thank you. Yeah. OK, so I think it's time to wrap up. Thank you again, Professor Grosch, to join us for this amazing presentation. We are really glad to have you here in this webinar series. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm very much honored. Thank you very much for organizing us and uh, putting together this conference and, and for the very good preparation of my talk. I'm impressed about how you obtained my CV. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.